General Stanley McChrystal knows a little something about leadership. The retired four-star general was the commander of U.S. and international forces in Afghanistan. The West Point graduate spent 34 years in the Army and is the co-founder of the McChrystal Group. Now he hopes to answer the question, what makes a leader great? With his new book called Leaders, Myth and Reality, he profiles 13 leaders from company founders like Coco Chanel to geniuses like Albert Einstein and visionaries like Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Luther. General McChrystal, good morning. It's great Thank to have you here. Thanks for having me. There are a billion leadership books. What I love about this one is you basically say the way we've thought about leadership is skewed. It's wrong. Explain why the different approach you're taking here. Well, I spent a, le a lifetime trying to learn and practice leadership. And then late in life, I came to the realization I really don't. And so as we started this study, we really came to the understanding that leadership is not what we think it is, and it never has been. We've looked at leadership through mythology, and, and that's just colored our vision. So one of the important myths that you take on early in the book to set the template for the way you look at this is the famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware River. So the famous painting that we all know, he's standing up on the boat in a way you would never stand in a boat even if it was on dry <laughs> land. And he's looking gorgeous and wonderful. And then you have a more realistic rendering of what it was actually lot like, not a boat, but a barge. What is the, what's important about those two distinctions? Well, what's important is we saw the original picture where he is leaning forward in this little rowboat in an icy river, and that's absurd. Mm. But we just accepted it because he is the leader and because he's George Washington. And we just say, well, that's sort of what we expect leaders to do. But no rational person would do that. He wouldn't have survived the war if he'd done that. Mm -hmm. And yet when we picture him more realistically, we say, well, that doesn't seem to be consonant with what we think about heroically. You even say because he's nervous, sort of gripping the wheel there, you know, I mean, holding on tight, right? In this more realistic version. I'd say rational because yeah. he's gripping the wheel. <laughs> yeah. By the way, he still looks brave in why, his exactly. photo. Why is it important at that crucial battle? Why is it important as for those of us trying to learn about leadership that we study picture two and not painting one? Because we want to believe the mythology that the leader's 10 feet tall, never scared, never wrong, has he answered all our questions? That's never correct. And we also tend to think that the leader's gonna solve the problem. It's not the leader solving the problem, it is the team solving the problem, the interaction between leaders and followers. And so we're much healthier if we pull back a little bit from the idea that the leader is all powerful. You say we shouldn't really talk about how they led, we should ask how did they emerge as a leader, and that every leader is different in person, is different in private than they are in person. That's, That's about absolutely the difference right. There. The fact is, we want to look at leaders a certain way, and we sometimes discount how they are in private, or we don't understand how they are in private. And sometimes we're very disappointed when they see how they are in private, because it just doesn't match part of the mythology that we have. But the reality is, every person is a human being. And so what we've got to do is look at these leaders holistically. We've got to expect certain things from them. They should inspire us. They should bring values. They should bring the team together. They should do those things that lets us as a group solve the problem. We should not sit back and wait for the leaders. And boy, you you leaders are not always virtuous, too, yeah. which I thought was interesting, mm -hmm. because we always think our, our leaders should be, have very high morals and have great character and great integrity, and you said that is not always the case. Well, it's, it's certainly not. If we look, Coco Chanel spent a number of years in an affair with a Nazi senior officer, Almost every one of the leaders we look at has something that the rest of us would take significant exception to. Did you know who Coco Chanel was? <laughs> when we started the book, I didn't. I didn't know she was a person. I thought it was just a name on handbags and perfume. So yeah. this book educated me significantly. Yeah. Well, talk about, I mean, your, since your father served and you went to West Point, you grew up revering General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate Journal. And just in the past couple of years, you threw out a painting that you've had your entire life. What changed your thinking about him? I grew up right near his home. I went to Washington Lee High School, and when I was a lieutenant, my wife gave me this inexpensive frame picture for 25 bucks of Robert E. Lee in his uniform, and I kept it for 40 years in every home we lived in. And then after Charlottesville, my wife pointed out that that's sending a message you may not want to send. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, he's just a general. He, he wasn't political. She says he's become political because people have used his image for that cause. Mm. And so I, I realized she was right and I threw it out because it meant something different yes. than I wanted it to mean. Yes. Yeah. And yet when you look at Robert E. Lee and you say, well, he's, if you say he was just a general, he was, he was a 
tremendous soldier for 32 years in the United States Army. He was probably the most revered officer rising through the ranks. But at the critical moment of his life, he made a decision to side with the South and to try to destroy the country that his hero, George Washington, had helped found. And he did it in defense of slavery. Now, a lot of people are coming around to your way of, 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 of thinking, Stan. He said we could call him Stan, not General. It still Please. seems like General to me. You said if you were running a company. I've been called company, worse, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Why you always, say about, always yeah. If you were running a company, you said you would hire Martin Luther King Jr. That's who you'd want to lead your company. It's interesting, and I didn't expect this when I read the book. Certainly, we all love the cause he was in, but the reality is his effectiveness at pulling together the civil rights cause was extraordinary because he was not an elected leader, an appointed leader. Mm -hmm. He was actually a moral leader pulling together a bunch of disparate groups against tremendous mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, resistance from the is, South yes. and some pretty murky political leadership at the national level. His ability for 12 years to navigate this from 1955 till he was assassinated in 1968 is really an extraordinary tale of leadership and management separate from what he was it's, uh, leading as a it's cause. It's such a great book. My favorite chapter is still about Albert Einstein. When yeah. He said, he said, why does everyone love me if they can't understand me? It's a great <laughs> way to put it for him. Because he looks like your uncle. Yes, <laughs> yes he does. Great read. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for joining us. Congratulations, General Stanley McChrystal.